slide. Uh, Dr. Murli will go first, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's fine. Should I take that? Uh, Vijay, now we are live. Uh, people are joining in. Uh, please give them five more minutes to join in. You could explain the ground rules for people to follow. Okay. And then Dr. Jagdish takes over. Sure. Uh, I, I can see people are just logging in, joining in, uh, yes. slowly moving in. Um, we have 30 plus people already and that yeah. is within 30 seconds of joining in. Yeah. I'll just put a good evening message to all those people, uh, which I will be anchoring the rest. Okay. Uh, we give two more minutes for people to join in. Uh, this is for participants. Uh, this is a message for participants. Dr. Murli Mohan, MD also from um, uh, India? Yes, yes, MD from Bangla Medical College, MBBS and MD BMC. Yeah, I know, BMC. Then uh, what is that called? SCE? Speciality Certificate Exam in Respiratory Medicine. Oh, respiratory medicine. So After the MRCP, it uh, qualifies you for uh, being a pulmonologist. Um, FRCP is awarded. Dr. Jagdish, we are live. Yeah. There are 30 okay. participants, Mahesh. Yeah, okay. This is uh, for the information of the participants. Uh, can I request you all uh, to, you know, use the Q&A section uh, to ask questions. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, chat box, uh, and, you know, the... Uh, uh, where you can exchange messages, if there are any. I'm just waiting for people to join. There's some more. I'm just just joined. Just two more minutes. I'm going to put it into only speaker mode. Yeah, I can see it's still, the people are still joining in. That's why. Yeah, I think we can start. Hello. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Vijay Harvishata. I'm one of the psychiatrists in Bangalore and coordinator for today's event. And uh, as you know, today we have an exciting uh, 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 event. And uh, this uh, 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 topic is related to uh, nicotine and uh, its abuse and uh, the, uh, the health impact. Um, Without wasting much time, uh, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Jagdish, who will uh, introduce the, uh, the, our guests. And uh, uh, just to give you ground rules, uh, the, 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 if you go at the bottom, uh, there are a few things there. One is Q&A &A section, where you can put your questions. And uh, in the chat box, you can uh, send messages, but the questions will be picked up from Q&A section. So, uh, over to Dr. Jagdish. Good evening. Welcome to today's uh, Tele Arogya program. Tele Arogya is a free app for all the doctors and patients. Most of the commercial apps available for telemedicine have some nominal fee. This is one from our uh, professional team for the doctors and for the patient free of cost. 
except for the gateway payment. Now, with this tele aragya introduction, uh, when the lockdown started, up to the phase three of lockdown, two things were banned. One is liquor, another was sale of tobacco. Once that the phase four lockdown started, they opened up both liquor and tobacco sale. The moment it was started, I guess all of you have seen that people standing in queues for hours to pick up buy liquor as well as tobacco. In one of the uh, rural areas of Karnataka, people were buying in kilos, quarter kilo, half kilo of tobacco, not in small, small packets. So what happens to these people during this COVID time? So to a very relevant topic today we have is health consequences of tobacco use, more so during COVID time. Today we have two distinguished speakers because tobacco use consequences fall in two domains. One, a physician and a respiratory medicine specialist. Another is psychiatrist. How, what are the consequences of use and how one should come out of it? So to have this discussion, an interesting discussion, we have two wonderful speakers. Dr. Murali Mohan did his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College, did his MD medicine also from Bangalore Medical College, comes from a prodigy of doctors who are well known in Karnataka. Later on, he went on to UK to pursue his MRCP. After that, he specialized in sleep, this respiratory medicine, and he also has FRCP. After coming back to India, he continued to work as a respiratory medicine specialist, as well as his area of interest is sleep. Most of our sleep patients who come to psychiatrists without any underlying psychological disorder, regularly refer to Dr. Murali Mohan and 80 to 90% of them turned out to be severe obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. He's one of the best sleep disorder specialists available in Bangalore. And he continues to be, he also head, he was heading the uh, internal medicine department at Narayan Hridayalaya uh, Majumdar Shah Medical Center. Now he continues to be the head of uh, respiratory medicine. He's quite actively associated with Indian Psychiatric Society Karnataka chapter an excellent quiz master, a very talented and a, a very good speaker. Today, we have Dr. Murli Mohan with us. Dr. Murli Mohan, thanks for coming and addressing our psychiatrist. I welcome you on behalf of Tele Arogya. Thank you, Dr. Jagdish. It's a pleasure to be here. Second, I guess my another speaker, Dr. Pratima Murthy, doesn't require any introduction. Still, it's my duty. She did her MBBS again from Bangalore Medical College. Later on, she did the Diploma of DPM from Nimans, one of the best outgoing students. She did MD, MD Medicine also. Later on, she joined as a faculty at uh, Nimhans. Her area of interest is addiction. She has done a lot of work related to women and alcohol, especially related to law and medicine. The pioneer work related to prison and psychiatry. Probably those are some of the things. She has also got FRCP. She has published many national and international uh, publications. And today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. P Pratima Murthy because I happen to be her classmate. Thank and you. And so far, you have listened to many speakers on one platform or one topic. Today, we have two special people. A couple are speaking on these two topics, Dr. Murli Mohan and Dr. Pratima. So I welcome Dr. Pratima to Tele Aragya's program on health consequences of tobacco use more so during COVID time. Thank you. It's over to Dr. Murli now. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Jagdisha. Those were very nice, very kind introductions. Uh, so today we're going to discuss one of the most important factors that impacts health uh, in all its aspects. And that is what this mannequin at the left of the screen shows you, that virtually every part of the body, both the inside and the outside, is badly impacted by tobacco use. It's also a pretty grotesque, horrifying mannequin, but those are the effects of tobacco. So let's see what these are. So this is something we've known for a long time. It's nothing new. In 1604, King James I of England, earlier of Scotland, said the use of tobacco is a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lungs, and the black stinking fume thereof, nearest resembling the horrible Stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless. So 
more than 400 years ago, this was known. We know that tobacco use is the world's leading cause of death. I'll just jump straight to the last line in that paragraph. It will kill 250 million children and adolescents alive today, a third of whom live in developing countries like ours. So this surely dwarfs the COVID pandemic that we are going through. And I think it deservedly is called the tobacco pandemic. It's important to remember that no amount of tobacco use is safe and no type of tobacco use is safe, including the variant that we have now, vaping or e-cigarette use. And we must remember that a long-term tobacco user has a greater than 50% chance of dying early from disease caused by tobacco. What's in a cigarette? This is well known to all of us, but we use this picture often to tell patients why it is important to stop. What they are using consists of things like candle wax and paint and vinegar and sewer gas, what's in batteries and industrial solvents and so on. So a whole host of things which individually are poisonous in small amounts, but together can be even more poisonous to the human being using tobacco. And this is not just in cigarettes, it's in any form of tobacco. So why is tobacco so dangerous? It's a complex mixture of over 4,000 chemical substances. It has two phases, a gaseous phase and a particulate phase. And these have pro-inflammatory effects, they have cytotoxic effects and they have carcinogenic effects. So there are multiple problems with tobacco smoke. One of the most important contents of tobacco is nicotine. And nicotine is what causes the addiction, which makes people addicted to tobacco. Among other things, what it causes is it increases the sympathetic activity that leads to faster heartbeat. It leads to coronary vasospasm. And in fact, you can see when a person takes Nicotine, while a coronary angiogram is done, you can actually see spasm of the coronary vessels. It leads to lipolysis and fatty acid release, which promotes the synthesis of VLDL and oxidized LDL, which lead to uh, atherosclerosis. One of the other major components of tobacco is tobacco smoke is carbon monoxide. And you can actually use carbon monoxide levels and carboxyhemoglobin levels to tell us who is smoking, and what is their level of exposure to tobacco smoke. But what does carbon monoxide do? It leads to endothelial cell dysfunction. And we know blood vessels run through the entire body, supply every single organ, tissue, and cell in the body uh, with blood. And these blood vessels are going to be dysfunctional. These organs are therefore going to suffer dysfunction if the endothelial cells dysfunction because the oxygen has to get across these and the endothelial cells actually secrete a substance which keeps these vessels open. So a smoker has decreased blood supply to all tissues and especially so the peripheries of the body. They also tend to have more lung damage, heart damage, and in fact, damage to every organ because of this endothelial cell dysfunction. Tobacco also has carcinogenic effects. Tobacco not only causes more mutations which lead to cancers, but also there's a decreased capacity to repair damage that occurs. And this is due to a variety of compounds that these days you must have heard about nitrosamines and their presence recently they said in ranitidine and the FDA banned it. These are present in high quantities in cigarettes and strangely cigarettes don't get banned. On the respiratory system, it has multiple effects. And because one who smokes takes it directly into the lungs, the brunt of disease of tobacco related problems is borne by the respiratory system. There's direct injury to the ciliated cells. The cells, the cilia look very abnormal. They don't beat properly. There's paralysis of the cilia. And this leads to problems in clearance of particles that settle on the airway, to the gaseous substances that settles on the airway, to the tar that settles in the lungs. So they cannot be cleared. And this leads to increased irritation of the airways, leading to more mucus. This is often sticky mucus and makes the person cough, the so-called smoker's cough. But later, this leads to damage of the lungs, bronchitis and emphysema. There's also obviously bacteria that come in all the time because we are inhaling liters and liters of air every minute. And this carries bacteria with it. And if we cannot clear these bacteria, there's an increased risk of lower respiratory tract infections. And that's the difference between normal tracheal mucosa on top 
And the topmost layer, the AC, to the top of the screen is a normal looking mucosa and you're seeing healthy looking cilia. And below that, there's not much of inflammatory cells. Below you have tracheal mucosa that's been exposed to cigarette smoke. This is a rat model. And you can see that there is amalgamation of the uh, cilia. They're all fused together and clearly cannot beat. And there's a variety of other changes, including thickening of the basement membrane, not allowing uh, mucus to be cleared and leading to greater damage to all layers of the respiratory tract. There's inhibition of other airway defenses. There's reduced effectiveness of the immune system and there's oxidative stress, which leads to damage. It also makes the type four collagen in the airway very sticky and weaker. So this leads to macrophages adhering and damaging the airway. And this inflammation leave, therefore leads to emphysema. So there's a variety of respiratory diseases, starting from acute respiratory infections, and going on to interstitial lung disease and lung cancer. The most common thing that we always talk about in Bangalore is asthma. And asthma is common in those who are exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. So even non-smokers get a higher risk of asthma. And these are also a greater problem in children of women who have smoked during pregnancy. So there's no direct airway exposure, but exposure crossing the placenta can lead to asthma later in children. And those who continue to smoke have greater airway irritability and a greater decline in the first expiratory volume in the first second, the lung volumes decline. Smoking worsens asthma control. I'm not going to take you through this very busy slide except to say that they had more sputum production, more cough and wheeze, more nocturnal symptoms and more shortness of breath compared to non-smokers or even ex-smokers. And this is important. If you quit smoking, your asthma control gets better. And this is also because drugs that we use for asthma are deactivated partially or completely by cigarette smoke. COPD is directly linked to cigarette smoking and worldwide is the major factor for say, COPD. In India, environmental, especially household pollution is also a very important factor. But the one thing which is easily preventable is quitting cigarette smoking. And you can see in this slide that as a person's smoking duration increases, the risk of developing COPD increases. And this increases even more among women, which is a worrying feature when we see increasing women smoking. And this is something I alluded to earlier with asthma, but COPD can also be initiated in utero. When the mother smokes, there's an impairment of lung function of her children. And just 10 cigarettes per day of maternal smoking increases the prevalence of COPD by almost 70% in the offspring. But it's not just the mother smoking, the grandmother smoking, if she has, when she is pregnant, a female fetus, that female fetus's eggs, the ova, get affected by the grandmother's cigarette smoke. And in later life, this affects the grandchild's lungs. They have smaller lungs and a greater risk of developing COPD in the future. So it affects not just that generation, but the next two generations. We know the diffuse parenchymal lung disease or interstitial lung disease. Some of them like respiratory bronchiolitis, RBILD, and desquamative interstitial pneumonitis are exclusive almost to smokers. And the others are also commoner, though not exclusive to smokers. The simple community acquired pneumonia is much more common in smokers and they have worse outcomes when they smoke. And there are many other non-neoplastic lung diseases varying from the very simple common cold going all the way up to DVT and pulmonary embolism, which can be fatal. And in all these, the risk comes down when a person quits tobacco use. Of course, we know lung cancer is well recognized as a major risk factor for uh, tobacco use is a major risk factor for lung cancer but it's also common in many other uh, cancers, head and neck being the most common. And this is nothing new. I'll call your attention to this paper from 1928, where they spoke about smokers' excess death rate. And this was not brought to the common man. It was not advertised widely until the mid sixties when the whistleblowers came out and linked these uh, excess death rates with tobacco use. So 1928, it's close to 92 years since this paper came out. In fact, it's more than 92 years. It came out in the NEJM in April 28. So that's bronchial carcinoma. 
and the risk of lung cancer among smokers is five to tenfold more uh, in developed countries. And smoking is responsible for more than 80% of all lung cancers. And the same is true of Indian uh, patients. Roughly two thirds of all our patients with lung cancers have been smokers, either cigarettes or BDs. Whereas among female patients, about 54 female, female patients in one study, only about 5% were smokers. This is because there's a low prevalence of tobacco smoking use among women, though this is not true of smokeless tobacco use, and I'm sure Pratima will talk about this later. So we always must think of a genetic predisposition among women, and we know that there are genes like the EGFR mutation, which increase the risk of uh, women developing uh, lung cancer, typically the adenocarcinoma. And this may be due to the effects of either environmental tobacco smoke or other pollutants, both outdoor and indoor air pollutants. And this risk varies from group to group. It can be as high as 15% in somebody who smoked for 100 pack years, and as little as 0.8% in somebody who quit nine years uh, ago. But it's very important to realize that even smoking after a diagnosis of cancer, when a person has been cured or treated, shortens survival time. And that's why we must encourage very strongly smoking sensation among people who have lung cancer, whether they are cured or they are in palliation. It's very, very important. The risk of cancer rises almost three and a half fold, a second primary cancer. And lung cancer we know has a terrible prognosis. We have improved the one year all state survival from 32% in 1973 to about 41% in 94. And it's a little higher than that now, close to, we have a better than 11 uh, month uh, survival for most patients. But the five year survival has remained virtually unchanged at 14%. Again, head and neck cancer. It's particularly in tissues through which the inhaled smoke passes or because people chew and retain the tobacco in the cheek, the quid, uh, there are very high levels of oral, buccal cancer, laryngeal cancer rates are 12 times higher among smokers. And we have sufficient causal relationships established for many lung cancers. I've listed it out here. And suggestive evidence for things like liver cancer, colonic cancer, prostate and breast. Urinary bladder, definitely more common in kidney cancer. And this is because the uh, tobacco products end up in the bladder finally. They're excreted through the kidney and then through the bladder. But it's interesting that recently studies have shown that even people who are vaping using electronic e-cigarettes have been shown to have increased amounts of cancer-associated products, bladder cancer-associated products in their urine. So it's not just tobacco smokers, but even e-cigarette use increases the risk many fold. We know that vascular diseases are a horrible way to die with gradually a limb getting reduced from a toe disarticulation, a forefoot disarticulation, a below knee, above knee, and the person gradually loses limb after limb. And here you have somebody on the right bottom who's after having all four limbs amputated, has a cigarette holder made out of a coat hanger by one of his friends. Atherosclerotic disease increases, and this has been reported to increase by more than 50% among persons who continue smoking compared to non-smokers. It's not the only risk factor, but it is the major risk factor. And smoking cessation as after a cancer diagnosis is equally or more important after a coronary intervention. People who continue to smoke after angioplasty had a more than three-fold increase, a three-quarter increase risk of death compared to non-smokers. A stroke risk is even higher, two and a half to three and a half times plus among people who smoke more than 20 cigarettes a day. And this is true of multiple forms of cerebrovascular accident. So we have a variety of cardiovascular diseases from atherosclerosis of all organs going down to peripheral vascular disease. The increased risk of diabetes is well known as also the risks of combined diabetes and smoking. Women are a particular risk group. They have special risks. They have increases in some types of cancer risks. They have a greater risk of osteoporosis. And as I already mentioned, during pregnancy, the baby suffers with lower birth weight, intrauterine growth retardation, increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome, and decreased lung function of the offspring. But it's not just smokers. It's not just tobacco chewers. Even people working with tobacco 
develop a fairly wide list of problems called green tobacco sickness. It's been reported in between one and 10% of US tobacco smokers. And we have similar data in Indian, in India with girls making BDs in, Tum in Tamil Nadu. Having a variety of problems, including poor reproductive outcomes among mothers who are engaged in BD work. And this is true of all forms of tobacco. Smokeless tobacco is just as bad as smoking tobacco. BDs are, if anything, worse than cigarettes. And you can see, just look at the extreme right column where BDs are compared with cigarettes. And the age adjusted relative risk of BD smoking is 1.78 compared to B, uh, cigarettes, which are 1.39, uh, data from PC Gupta and group. And the death rates are much higher among those who use smoking tobacco. Uh, reproductive effects of smoking, fertility, pregnancy, the newborn baby are all affected. And there are various oral effects. We won't go into that, but those who chew tobacco have oral submucous fibrosis, apart from a variety of problems, and most dangerously of all, oral cancers. There are also other effects which we won't go into. Poorer wound healing, worse outcomes after surgery, every single organ, and worryingly, which people, young men don't realize, erectile dysfunction. And of course, there are economic consequences, there are environmental consequences, global warming, and a whole variety of indirect health effects that we have not even begun speaking of in this talk. So as I mentioned earlier, the whole body can affect, get affected. But one of the things that I'm often asked is, I smoke only a few cigarettes a day, doctor. Am I at risk? And I like to show them this slide very often, which looks at the increase in risk. This on the top left is all cancers by cigarette consumption. And you can see that the risk starts to rise even with just one to four cigarettes. Look at the y-axis, that's in 100 cigarettes. So that's actually a huge risk in cig uh, cancers by, with just one to four cigarettes a day. Lung cancer, even higher. And the relative list for lung cancer compared with non-smokers is almost fivefold with just one to five cigarettes a day. And this is true of ischemic heart disease. Again, huge increases at one to four cigarettes a day. And all-cause mortality is again hugely increased with one to four cigarettes a day. So no level of cigarette smoking is risk-free. Every cigarette carries an additional risk. And of course, the effects of smoking cessation are well known. I'll just summarize by saying these benefits start within 20 minutes and continue over the next 24 hours and continue to improve over the next 10 years. Every day, things are getting better and better. A few slides on tobacco and COVID-19 because that's really the worry these days. And anything I say, I must bring like cigarette packets with a statutory warning. We are seeing everyday new papers, most of these findings are associative or speculative. Most of them have come from articles that are inadequately peer reviewed. Many of the reported findings will need to be revisited as evidence accumulates. And it's very important. We saw just recently two papers from the NEGM and Lancet were withdrawn because their findings have been disputed. The data has been disputed. But it's well established that all forms of tobacco are injurious to health and this does not need to carry a statutory warning. So we know that handling of cigarettes and handling of tobacco brings the hands into contact with the face and can transfer the virus to the body. So smoking and other tobacco use can increase your chances of getting COVID-19 as also sharing tobacco products. And one of the confusions for us in smokers when a person comes with increased smoking, is this a smoker's cough? Is it an exacerbation of their COPD or is it COVID-19? To the extreme right, you'll see that most studies, this is one study which showed that severe cases and those needing mechanical ventilation or death are commoner in current smokers than those who are never smokers. And negative outcomes, those who progress negatively have worse outcomes, again, commoner in smokers than in non-smokers. Specifically, we have increased risk and severity of pulmonary infections because I already mentioned pulmonary immune function and damage to the upper airways and the intrathoracic airway suffers. There's excessive platelet dependent thrombin generation. So thrombotic risk is increased and there's increased carboxyhemoglobin. So the oxygen carrying capacity of RBCs is reduced. Why do I mention these? Because there's a worse inflammatory response in SARS-CoV-2 in COVID infection. 
This is already high. It's triggered off by the body's responses to COVID-19. And smoking increases the amount of angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. So there's a greater risk of the virus latching onto these receptors and causing increased viral loads within the lung. It also increases the number of inflammatory responses among smokers. So we have greater viral load, we have a greater inflammatory response. One of the markers that we use is serum ferritin to tell us about inflammation. And already smokers have a significant increase in serum ferritin levels. And hyperferritinemia is one of the markers for a severe outcome of COVID-19. Also, tissues are already starved of oxygen. This is thought to be one of the conditions uh, or one of the factors that increases the problem called happy hypoxia. People are hypoxic. They don't realize hypo how hypoxic they are and often are dead within 10 minutes of their hypoxia being realized. And smokers already have decreased oxygen carrying capacity because of carboxyhemoglobin. So here we have a cytokine storm because of inflammation. We have an increased endothelial activation. We have pathological coagulation. And this storm of condition gives rise to the perfect storm that is COVID-19. Even earlier, one of the things that we use to recognize COVID-19 is the presence of anosmia and ajusia. And these are already common findings in smokers. So they confuse the picture in diagnosis, worsen outcomes, and cause a lot of confusion in all stages of management. So one of the studies showed that current smokers had an increased risk of infection. So let's not belabor this topic anymore. COVID-19 increases the risk of uh, having poor outcomes already and among smokers is even worse of getting the infection and of having worse outcomes. And the WHO has come out very clearly and said, smoking does not protect against COVID-19. In fact, smoking is deadly. Now, Pratima is going to take you through opportunities of the awareness of harms from tobacco use and how we should use this crisis to get people off this harmful effects of tobacco. And I'll just say that quitting tobacco is the single most important step a person can take to improve not just the duration, but also the quality of one's life. And in 17th century uh, Istanbul, Murad IV of Turkey, used to roam around trying to get him, he was the king. He tried to go roam around trying to get vendors to sell him tobacco. And if they did, which was against his official policy, he would behead them on the spot. A grisly warning to other would-be lawbreakers. We don't have those laws now, and we certainly don't want such drastic measures to curtail tobacco use. So Pratima is going to take you through some kinder ways of getting patients to quit tobacco use. I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Murli. Uh, over to you, madam. Thank you very much. I'm just starting to share my slides. Okay, so uh, we've just, uh, on, the, on the 31st of May, we commemorated World No Tobacco Day. And this year, it's about industry manipulation of youth in terms of uh, you know, tobacco use. So I think it's very important to understand that tobacco is possibly the single most preventable cause of death in the world today. And it's the only legal product that kills half the people who use it as intended. And we estimate in a few years time that the number of deaths from tobacco will be more than malaria, maternal, conditions and injuries combined. And with the COVID epidemic upon us, these numbers may actually get even more aggravated. We know that tobacco is one of the preventable risk factors for a variety of NCDs that Murli spoke about. And when combined with alcohol, unhealthy diet, stress, and other forms of pollution, the risk to NCDs and the outcome from NCDs can be severely compromised, it can be worse. So the message, the first message I think we need to give people is that it's better not to start than developing an addiction and then have to seize it. So as health professionals, one of the things we need to look at is how we can enhance protective factors and reduce risk factors to any form of health, in this case, tobacco use, 
We also know that tobacco is a gateway drug to other substances, both licit and illicit. And therefore, we need to look at protecting people against all forms of drug use. And of course, we need to tailor the messages depending upon the age, the background, and the location. One of the things we've realized is if you talk to young people about remote events like cancer or diabetes, it may not hit home. For young people, for example, messages on how prematurely they're likely to age or sexual dysfunction may be more uh, kind of very strong messages to discourage their smoking. The other thing is that preventive efforts cannot be single. They need to be long-term and repeated. So there's no point in only celebrating or commemorating one day as World No Tobacco Day. Every day needs to be No Tobacco Day. And what's very interesting for youth is this very interesting thing which the tobacco companies actually foster. And the way it was actually mentioned in one of the board of directors reports is that smoking for a beginner is a symbolic act that they've individuated and become very independent. And therefore, you know, they're very macho. And what the company suggests is once you get the psychological symbolism, that's good enough because afterwards the pharmacotherapy will take over and sustain the habit. We also know that drug, uh, that tobacco companies use surrogate advertisement, and that's something that we need to caution the public about. Let's go to the reasons why people use tobacco, which is very important if we're going to help them to avoid tobacco use. So one of the things, of course, is apart from the curiosity, the, you know, the stress and the self-medication, the social reward when tobacco is used in a peer group, the combined association with alcohol use, there's also the genetic risk. But then, as they say, genes load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So the lifestyle of tobacco use can actually aggravate the health harms from tobacco use. I just like to talk about some smokeless tobacco users and some experiences that they shared with us in terms of how early in life they use smokeless tobacco. And some of them switch from smoking to smokeless tobacco to avoid the smells from smoking and the perception that perhaps chewing tobacco is less harmful than smoking tobacco. And again, the reasons for smokeless tobacco use is boredom, some degree of enjoyment, relief of tiredness. Many of our people also initiate smokeless tobacco because of peer pressure or learning from adults. And once they get habituated, it helps their bowel movement, which is the most important reason why they, why they continue to use smokeless tobacco. And unfortunately, smokeless tobacco can also be used in places where smoking is prohibited, including at work, in public places, and that perpetuates smokeless tobacco. And some people have initiated smokeless tobacco as early as five to 10 years of age. They can give up jobs but they feel miserable when they give up smokeless tobacco and therefore they're unable to quit because it's a, you know, it's become a habit. And, uh, you know, one of the arguments is that the rich use better forms. This is the only kind of thing that we can use to uh, get, uh, you know, get a bit of relaxation. Uh, and they, people feel that it's a harmless relaxation. People don't know how to quit. People do not have an awareness. Just last week, we released a report in Karnataka where almost 90 to 95% of people do not know about services that are available for tobacco cessation. And this is true of the National Mental Health Survey too, where 91% was really the treatment gap as far as tobacco is concerned. So we all need to make people aware that tobacco cessation is possible. But why is it so difficult? It's because all forms of tobacco contain nicotine, which is one of the most uh, strong psychoactive substances. And that's why quitting tobacco is so difficult. It's not possible to just tell people to stop tobacco. That's what we used to do about 10 or 15 years ago. But now we need to be much more supportive to people in their quit attempt, especially when a person is addicted to nicotine. The Empower approach of the World Health Organization talks about the various policies to address tobacco uh, use and encourage cessation. And one of the things is to offer help to quit tobacco. 
to warn about the dangers of tobacco. And these two, the P and the O, lie within the healthcare sector. So those of us who are in the healthcare sector need to tell people about the dangers of tobacco and more importantly, offer them help to quit tobacco. Another second message that I'd like to give is that addiction is a brain disease. We know that nicotine acts in the same reward centers in the brain where alcohol, where heroin, where cocaine, all of them act. We recognize now that addiction is not just a failure of will or a lack of strength of character, but because of the changes in neurochemical circulation in the brain. And just like diabetes or hypertension, tobacco addiction is also a chronic relapsing condition. People need to be educated, supported, and followed up if they are to be helped to give up tobacco. Worldwide, we know that the five A's approach is the possibly the simplest and most pragmatic approach to help people to quit tobacco, asking about tobacco use in every health encounter. We still don't do it routinely. Assessing the extent of dependence as well as the readiness to quit, advising people very strongly and unequivocally about the importance of stopping tobacco use and linking it to their present health condition. More importantly, assisting them in a quit attempt. And if one is not able to help them, arranging for additional help to get them to quit. So what do we ask people in terms of tobacco use? We ask about the type of tobacco that they use, the quantity and frequency, the duration, the last use of tobacco. We assess the severity of addiction by using what is called the Fagostrom's test or any other test of nicotine dependence. We assess clinically for craving and tolerance and for withdrawal symptoms. We also assess their readiness to quit. Are they ready? Are they not sure? And what attempts have they made in the past to quit tobacco? This is the Fagostrom's questionnaire, which really asks how soon do they use tobacco as soon as they get up. And that's one of the strongest indicators of withdrawal because all night they have not had nicotine in their blood. And therefore, the soon, as, as soon as they get up, they need to use their first, uh, they have their first smoke. Then of course, there is also a difficulty to refrain even when they are in places where tobacco use is forbidden, which is a cigarette or BD they would find most difficult to give up. The, free, the quantity of use and whether they smoke more frequently in the first part of the day after waking up than the rest of the day, and even when they're ill, whether they smoke. A score of above a seven or more indicates very severe dependence. A score of four or more indicates moderate dependence. Similar uh, evaluations can be done for smokeless tobacco. The next message is that people need to be advised and assisted using different methods. The best moment of intervention is when the person seeks a health consultation because at that time the person is willing to listen to the fact that tobacco use is harmful and giving up tobacco is a very very important decision that they need to make. Self-help tips are very very important. How to handle craving, the four D's that we talk about, what to do with restless fingers, what to do with a restless mouth. Then of course in the psychosocial interventions, we, after we educate the patient, we help them to set a quit date, not too far away in the next week or two. We get support from the family, from friends, uh, you know, other forms like, the, you know, there are, uh, there are support uh, avenues on the internet. Uh, we prepare the person to say, uh, before the quit date to get rid of all the tobacco products, to decide what they're going to do if they have a craving. And then on the day of the quit date, we actually get them to stop all tobacco products. In addition to the psychosocial interventions, there are pharmacological interventions. The most important thing is, of course, follow up and relapse prevention. Why is that important? Mark Twain probably said it the best. He said, I have quit a thousand times before, indicating that quitting is possible, but people relapse very often. Relapse is practically the rule and people need about four to five attempts before they can actually quit. So one mustn't get frustrated if people are not able to quit in the initial part of the engagement. One of the things I find very useful is actually using a balance sheet approach, where I first talk to the patient about the advantages of tobacco use. Patients are quite puzzled. Why is a doctor asking me about the advantages? And then it's 
good to tell them, look, you would not be using it if it did not have any advantages for you. You start talking to them. Does it relax them? Does it reduce their stress? Does it improve their concentration? And then gradually you increase the, you start a dialogue on the not so good things about tobacco. And when the person starts listing what they have heard, what they have experienced about the not so good things, they themselves will have you know, a motivation towards quitting because they know that there are transient advantages, but more disadvantages by continuing to use tobacco. And when you add COVID to the balance sheet, the need to quit will become that much more. You talk about the good things about quitting, what are the advantages in terms of health, in terms of relationships, in terms of their finances, in terms of their concerns about their children, for example, for whom they may be setting a bad example by continuing to use tobacco, and the fears about giving up tobacco. Very often it's worries about craving, it's losing friends, it's worries about how they will deal with stress. And if you suggest alternate ways of dealing with some of these problems, it helps them to quit tobacco. The advice needs to be personalized, specific, most importantly, non-judgmental. I think all of us know that a non-judgmental approach produces the best results among our patients, expressing empathy that it is difficult to give up an addiction, encourage quitting attempts, personalizing the change, linking the person's underlying health problems and the need to quit, providing brief counseling in every meeting with the patient, educating about addiction, we always provide self-help material to patients so that they themselves can read it and internalize it, offer medications as needed, and follow up uh, at least for about six months to a year. For patients who are ready to quit, congratulate them on a decision to quit, fix a quit date. It's good to involve one of the family members or friends in a decision. If the, especially the spouse is also a tobacco user, sometimes it's good to get them both to support each other in the quit attempt. Provide the help as a health professional. Oh, of course, earlier we used to talk about choosing a method either to gradually reduce or to abruptly quit. We know that a gradual reduction is actually very, very difficult. Very few people are able to do that. So a cold turkey method or a method where you can Supplemented with pharmacotherapy is possibly better than you know, choosing to gradually quit uh, and providing specific medications or referring to a tobacco cessation clinic or to a professional who is specialized in quitting is more important. Now, it's also important that the patient understands nicotine withdrawal and craving, the fact that it will be onset in a few hours time, it will be quite high during the three to four days after stopping tobacco and will gradually reduce over the next one to three weeks. We know that hunger and craving can last for six months or more, but the most important thing is that craving comes like waves and actually goes away. So if the person learns to anticipate craving, handle craving, then the person will understand that the craving is, doesn't stay forever and the person feels much better once the cravings have subsided. I mentioned the four Ds earlier. The most important thing is you delay the craving, distract or do something else like exercising, drinking sips of water, slow deep breaths, and discussing the urges with or somebody in the family who helps them or with the health professional can help the person to deal effectively with the, various, uh, with the craving. Preventing relapse is very, very important. And for this, your engagement with the patient in terms of dealing with high-risk situations, particularly, for example, waking up in the morning, being around pe people who are smoking uh, is very important. And how to handle craving. In fact, there are lots of uh, resources that are available which teach people simple methods of having something like light your long in the mouth, you know, using a rubber band to kind of not keeping the hands from being, becoming very restless. Uh, the uh, four Ds that I mentioned, taking one day at a time, reminding themselves of the reasons for quitting can all be very effective counseling strategies to help people. Of course, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness meditation, these are all forms that may be helpful to patients. One thing is very clear that the more in-depth the counseling is, the greater are the chances for quitting. Finally, we know that managing stress is very important. Therefore, teaching people to manage uh, stress in terms of 
understanding the sources of their stress, learning how to manage it, making sure they have enough distractions. Diet and sleep are very, very important, as is exercise. And time management is also very critical. Spirituality is very helpful to some people. And the fact that they need to try even if they fall, even if they slip, not to convert a lapse into a relapse is very, very important for tobacco cessation. We know that there are underlying mood problems, anxiety problems, which also need to be treated if you want the person to successfully quit. Because addiction is a chronic relapsing condition, it's very important to keep in touch with the patients. And now we know that you know, telephones, SMS, email, other forms of telecounseling are equally important. So reminding, sending them reminder SMSs to keep in touch may also be very effective ways of keeping in touch with patients. There are lots of materials that are available to patients, you know, and these can be used to educate them better. I'll end up in the last five minutes talking about some of the experiences that we've had. In India, we've been running the tobacco cessation uh, clinics right from the early 2000s. And in one of our, uh, we had clinics all around the country and we had uh, you know, almost 34,000 patients registered in the first five years of the clinic when we started. And when we evaluated the outcomes for patients with simple counseling, the quit rates uh, in the patients we saw was about 31%. And nearly 50% of patients had reduced their intake by 50% or more even assuming that patients lost to follow up had not improved in the early days of the tobacco cessation clinics we had 14% who self reported quitting and 22% who had reduced tobacco by 50% or more this was very very encouraging to us and since then there has been a lot of expansion of tobacco cessation facilities one other important thing that we learned is that if you kept people in follow up the number of people who quit at three months, six months, and nine months actually increased over time. So this tells us that if you want to prevent relapse, a continuum of care is very, very important. You retain patients in follow-up, they are likely to give up tobacco. The WHO says that in addition to counseling, use toll-free quit lines as well as pharmacotherapy to help patients. I'll first talk about the quit line and what is called the M cessation. The M cessation program has now been running for the last five or six years. If you do not, in addition to what you do for your patients, if you want them to have additional resources, ask them to give a missed call to 011-2290-1701. They will be connected to the National Health Portal through which they receive SMS messages on the importance of quitting, setting a quit date, getting support, monitoring their craving, monitoring their mood. There is a lot of information also on the NHP in terms of how to sleep better, how to deal with anxiety, how to improve mood, how to manage craving. And a lot of patients, uh, people who have called in to the M cessation have benefited from the, uh, this service. I'll, I'll talk about the data about this a little in, at the end of my presentation. We've also initiated the National Tobacco Quitline Services at NIMHANS. It's about one and a half years old. And this is a toll-free number, 1-800-112-356. In the north of India, it runs from the VP Chest Institute. For southern India, from Nimhans. In Mumbai, from the Tata Memorial Hospital. And in the eastern part, from Guwahati. And the quit lines work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on all days except Mondays. In the southern quit line, the counselors provide counseling in six South Indian languages, uh, including, of course, uh, apart from Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, and Malayalam, also in English and Hindi, and it covers the southern states. So I'll uh, also talk about pharmacotherapy before I wind up, and then give you some evidence on what seems to work. All of us know that nicotine gums are available, nicotine lozenges are also available, there are transdermal patches, nasal sprays, and inhalers. These are all what are called nicotine replacement uh, therapies, where instead of taking nicotine with all the chemicals that Murli talked about, you give them uh, pure nicotine without the chemicals and you gradually uh, reduce it uh, based on how the person responds. So one thing is that when you look at the way the plasma nicotine changes, you'll see the blue line, which tells you how there are rapid ups and downs in the nicotine levels with cigarettes. What happens with the patches in the gums is that they provide more stable blood levels of nicotine so that the person does not experience craving. 
In terms of the gum, pastille, or the lozenge, you get them in 2 mg and 4 mg uh, strengths. For less than 25 cigarettes, the 2 mg is recommended. For greater than 25, the 4 mg is recommended. Typically a chew and park method, where the person slowly chews the gum till they get a peppery taste. They park it between the gum and the inner cheek until that peppery taste comes. Whenever the person gets a craving, they can use it. Once the peppery taste stops, the person uh, chew, packs the gum into a bit of newspaper and then discards it. So these are quite safe and they're effective in controlling the withdrawal symptoms. Uh, the nicotine patch is available as 7, 14 and 21 milligram patches. For people using more than 10 cigarettes a day, the 21 milligram patch is recommended. Usually the nicotine levels that are obtained are about half that of smoking. The important thing is to apply the patch on a non-hairy skin, to have the patch on only during the day, take it off at night, and to keep changing the location of the patch so that there is no skin irritation. Because it produces sleep disturbances, it's not recommended at night. And in addition to the patch, the person may also use gum for any breakthrough craving. So that was the nicotine replacement therapy. The second strategy is to use non-NRT medications. And two, the two most popular medications that are used are bupropion and varaniclin. Bupropion, as we all know, is an antidepressant, but independent of its depressant, antidepressant properties, it is effective in tobacco cessation. So it started usually as 150 mg daily, and after about four days, it's increased to 150 mg twice a day with an eight hour gap in between. The person does not immediately quit, unlike in NRT, here, the person sets a quit date about 10 to 14 days after starting bupropion. And then the person can abruptly stop the tobacco and not experience any withdrawal symptoms. Bupropion is usually continued for about three months, but can be continued up to six months or even longer. Usually within the first two months, there is no improvement. It's not likely to help. Dry mouth, insomnia and seizures are important side effects. And one has to be very cautious in people with diabetes and seizures. So bupropion acts by its, anti uh, its dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. It decreases the withdrawal and it decreases the craving and reinforcement. The other drug is varaniclin, which is a partial agonist at the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors. And it prevents the withdrawal by its agonistic activity and decreases the reinforcing effects by antagonizing nicotine present at high doses. Varaniclin comes as a initial startup pack and a maintenance pack. It's usually started at 0.5 milligram per day, increased to 0.5 milligram BD, and then the maintenance dose is one milligram uh, twice a day. As with bupropion, the person usually sets a quit date after about a week to 10 days of starting varaniclin and then can suddenly uh, stop the tobacco. When you look at the effectiveness and abstinence with a variety, this is a slightly older meta-analysis, but I think it very clearly emphasizes that the odds ratio of being able to quit is possibly best with varaniclin, followed by various NRTs, as well as with bupropion. So these drugs increase the chance of, double the chance of quitting or triple the chance of quitting. Uh, more recently, Hatsukami, this is, this is also quite, uh, you know, it's about 2008, um, also looked at the odds ratio of uh, comparing the various pharmacotherapies. And you'll see here again that uh, in addition to uh, varaniclin, bupropion, and NRT, nortriptyline, which is a cheaper uh, antidepressant, also has a good odds ratio of quitting, as does clonidine. So I think but the most uh, well-tested uh, treatments are bupropion, NRT, and varaniclin. This is a much more recent forest uh, plot, just published a couple of years ago, which, uh, which did a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And I think it's very, very important that I run you through this particular thing. When you look at only bupropion versus pharmacotherapy, the odds ratio of quitting are here. The more you move to the right, the greater are the odds ratio of quitting. And you'll see that NRT also pushes it to the right, indicating thing. Counseling, especially intensive counseling, is also increases the odds ratio of quitting. And when you combine bupropion with counseling, you'll see that this possibly has one of the best odds ratio of quitting. The most important thing, therefore, is that psychosocial counseling, along with pharmacotherapy, produces the best results in terms of quitting. 
I mentioned to you about M cessation. We actually looked at more than 10 to 12,000 people in the initial days of the M cessation. And we, uh, it was recorded that 34% of patients who had, con who had been contacted after they had enrolled in the M cessation reported making a quit attempt and 19% of them had successfully quit. We are now looking at a program which looks at tobacco cessation in patients with severe mental illness with combined behavioral and pharmacological support intervention. And I'll tell you why this is so important. This is a study done by Simon Gilbody et al, which actually suggests that in people with severe mental illness, when you combine counseling and pharmacotherapy, the chances of quitting are significantly much more, both at six months at 12 months, than compared to treatment as usual, which is usually just a recommendation for pharmacotherapy. So this is a uh, study that one of our residents undertook where he looked at patients with severe mental illness uh, with schizophrenia or mood disorder and found that tobacco use in any form was present in all, about a third of these patients, both in smoking as well as in smokeless forms. The disturbing fact was that nearly 59% of these patients had not been asked for tobacco use according to their self-report and less than 11% of them had been provided assistance in, in, in spite of having a tobacco cessation facility. And this I think is something that's an uh, issue all over the country. So we definitely need to offer patients support for tobacco cessation. If you can't offer it yourself, arrange for help particularly patients who have comorbidity. Murlin presented so many comorbidities that can occur with tobacco use. It's important to do that and supplement your uh, interventions with M cessation or tobacco quit line or refer them to a specialized tobacco cessation facility. I want to summarize by saying that tobacco use in any form is dangerous to health. Obviously, it's better to encourage people not to start. The earlier the person quits, the better. And for those dependents, support and assistance is very, very important. COVID presents a huge opportunity for encouraging patients to quit and for reducing the treatment gap, which as I mentioned is 90%. And the public needs to be aware of the opportunities and support for quitting. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. We'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pratima, madam. Uh, I think we have start already started having questions there. And um, it was a very comprehensive uh, presentation by both. Uh, by now, I think uh, at some point, uh, 60 odd people had uh, logged in. So there are quite a, a number of participants today. Uh, this is uh, very uh, uh, good news. Um, okay, uh, this one is for uh, uh, Madam. Madam, uh, uh, I just had a couple of questions here. Uh, what are the main causes of relapse in the study that you had undertaken, this, this uh, big survey? you had uh, mentioned. Okay. The most common cause of relapse uh, in patients is craving. Okay. Uh, the second is, of course, stressful situations or life events. That's another time when the thing. Low mood is also very important. Stress and, uh, I mentioned stress and anxiety. Sometimes patients uh, are in uh, peer pressure, of course, when they're working in, uh, you know, in places where People are other people are smoking during their breaks, etc. Then also there is a urge to smoke. External cues, seeing other people smoking, looking at you know advertisements for smoking, these can also spark off a craving. So internal triggers as well as external triggers. Does this mean do all patients uh, who come for tobacco cessation need uh, some kind of screening for uh, you know possibility of uh, some kind of a neurotic illness or something? Is it necessary for all? I, I would absolutely emphasize that it's very important to look for temperamental issues, uh, or genetic risk for, for tobacco dependence, as well as any access one issues, dep depression, anxiety, any other psychiatric symptoms, because they are likely to increase the chance of relapse. Okay. Tobacco itself is addictive. By itself, it is when all these other things are also comorbid, the chance of relapsing is also higher. This one is for Dr. Murli. Uh, why some chronic smokers do not have any complications? <laughs> I, I prefer to say they haven't yet developed any complications because if you look at the entire list, 
sooner or later, people develop one of these complications. It's just a matter of time. But yes, I mean, I think some people are remarkably resistant to these problems. For example, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, the classic example, he smoked and drank and had the highest stress levels anybody can have, you know, living through several wars. He was in the Boer War, he was in the World War I, he was prime minister when England was threatened with invasion. Uh, he had some of the comorbidities that Pratima referred to. He suffered from depression lifelong, which he called his black dog. And yet, he was able to lick all of these, lead a very successful life, and at the same time, didn't have any of these morbidities that you expect from smoking. So there's a genetic factor that increases susceptibility. There's also a genetic factor that increases risk. So some people are just lucky. But he finally died of urinary bladder cancer. He did. He you did. Know, but at a pretty late yeah. stage. I remember yeah. this because at a, when I was very young and I addressed a group of journalists, one of them said, oh, you know, you're talking about smoking and its risks. Winston Churchill lived so old. At that point in time, I hadn't realized this fact. So I went and looked it up and then realized that finally he did, it did catch up with him. He might have lived a few more years had it not been for tobacco. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, yes, looks like an odd question. Uh, what is the maximum number of cigarettes that, uh, you know, a person uh, has reported to you that he has used? The, the, the most, the highest number of well, probably about three or four packs. That's, that's as much as I can recall. Yes, a typical person is a chain smoker. And I, I've, I've had several patients who've been smoking three or four packs. And some of these are the Western packs of 20s. We're talking about 60 to 80 cigarettes a day. You know, so that's during the waking day, that's virtually all the time. You li literally are lighting one cigarette off the previous one's butt. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Madam, uh, is there a role for uh, nicotine vaccination? Somebody's asking Kiran Kumar. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was a time in the 90s, in the you know late 90s, there was a lot of excitement, Nikvax and stuff like that. But as far as I know, none of them have really paid off. Okay. Uh, Santosh Prabhu is asking, would drugs like Natrixone play a role, especially in people with polysubstance dependence? With polysubstance dependence, Certainly one would look at naltrexone, but specifically, they have, I mean, I'm not aware of specifically any studies which have focused on naltrexone purely for tobacco cessation. And, it's uh, prominently been the drugs that I mentioned. What about venlafaxin? Uh, again, does it help? Again, one of the things is the comorbidities that exist. When there are comorbidities, perhaps many of the antidepressant drugs may have a benefit. But specifically for tobacco uh, cessation, um, the, uh, there hasn't been any RCT which have you know, unequivocally established the role for any of the other drugs. Going back to the naltrexone question, uh, does it help uh, in uh, reducing craving or anything like that? Uh, I mean, again, perhaps non-specifically because it does have some effect on the dopaminergic system. One would expect that it would have some effect. Uh, but uh, as I said, uh, as a specific action on the nicotinergic, uh, the acetylcholinergic receptors, I'm not aware that uh, naltrexone, there have been any studies which have looked at naltrexone in that regard. Uh, okay, uh, this is for Dr. Murli uh, from my side. Uh, what is the latest research on uh, uh, use of chronic use of nicotine on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's? Uh, to my knowledge, and I think probably Pratima is a better person to ask this, answer this, but uh, we know that nicotine does help to, you know, slow down, improve performance, uh, but the negative effects are also very, very large. So I think, you know, if you looked at the risk benefit ratio, this is not the way to go. But yes, there have been better performances on tests. Uh, whether it really retards Alzheimer's is much more difficult to answer. But I think it does make a person with Alzheimer's or with any form of early dementia perform better on the tests that are conducted. Um, yeah, thanks. This is for Madam. Madam, in, uh, with regard to, uh, you know, hospital having policies, no smoking policies, uh, for example, in priority world in uh, Nimans or something like a high dependency unit where uh, I mean it's it's in fact very easy to manage them if you allow them to have one odd cigarette probably once in two hours or something 
it's negotiable actually. But because we have a general blanket policy on hospitals, we are not allowing them to smoke. This will create problems uh, and nurses having to deal with uh, agitation and to the extent of even having to rapid tranquilize them. Uh, so what's your take on that? I think Generally. that's very, it's very, very important, I think. And I, that's why I highlighted that study for that, you know, that one of the residents did, that in terms of assessment of tobacco use, of nicotine withdrawal, I do not think we do it adequately anywhere in our residential settings. And I think a lot of patients need to be asked this. We do know that patients with psychosis, there is a tendency to use tobacco you know, uh, at least as much as the general population, if not um, more in Western studies, it's much more that hasn't been established as well in our uh, setup. But if we offered them some NRT, I think a lot of the nicotine withdrawal aspect of it would be reduced. We've been successful in doing it in the de-addiction facilities, but I think hospitals need to take it on in other facilities as well. So I think it's very, very important to do that. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, what's your opinion on uh, use of e-cigarettes? I think more and more evidence is accumulating that e-cigarettes are harmful, as harmful as cigarettes and sometimes even more. Uh, the production and sale of e-cigarettes in the United States, for example, is unregulated. And a lot of young people are using it. Companies have come out with additions to the liquid, to the cartridges that have been shown to be harmful. We had that horrible outbreak of, you know, uh, in, uh, lung injury, inhalation lung injury associated with vaping. And with this was a lot in young people, teenagers, very young adults. And these people have been left respiratory cripples for life. Those who did recover have been left with a lot of fibrosis in the lung. I was just referring during my talk to a recent study I looked at where they reported the presence of at least six bladder cancer causing substances isolated from the urine of patients who were, or people who were vaping. So we don't know what all are the contents of the cartridges that are used for vaping. Uh, they were used and I'm aware of some people who have used it as a way to, uh, you know, like a nicotine replacement therapy. But I think there must be a very definite plan to use them. And I think there are safer nicotine replacement therapies. We don't really need to go to e-cigarettes. And I think it's a very good decision on the part of uh, the government to ban their sale. Uh, Karnataka was one of the first states to ban their sale. And I think now they're banned across the country. So I think that's a very good decision. I, you know, I, do, I don't think they're safe in any form. Sir, you mentioned about this uh, agusia. Agusia, am I, have I pronounced yes. it right? Yeah, is it? Uh, so uh, somebody's asking, what is it? Is it uh, olfactory or the gustatory? Anosmia is loss of Anosmia. olfactory sense. Uh, yeah. So you don't smell very clearly. And that's been shown to be one of the important features of uh, uh, coronavirus uh, infection, an early symptom. Agusia or agusia is part of, is loss of taste sensation. And we must remember that the two are closely linked. The smell, taste, sensation are closely linked. And a lot of our, you know, appreciation of food comes from the aroma or smell. Uh, so when a person's sense of smell goes down, the taste also goes down. And incidentally, that's one of the reasons why when a person is trying to quit, they put on weight. Their sense of smell improves. Consequently, their sense of taste improves. The direct appetite suppressing or anorexic action of nicotine uh, comes down. So their appetite improves. So they tend to eat more naturally. And that's something that, you know, a lot of people are very worried about. I'll put on weight uh, if I quit smoking and this helps me to stay thin. One of the reasons why models are supposed to smoke and smoke quite heavily. Uh, but this is something we need to take into account. I think the risk uh, of putting on weight is much less than the risk of continuing tobacco use. Okay. Madam, once I was woken up, I got really upset. Uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, later, I found out that uh, it was because of uh, varenicline causing psychosis in a patient. Uh, how often do you see? Okay. And we are aware that, you know, earlier when varenicline was initially introduced, there was a black box warning that it can cause agitation, it can cause an exacerbation of psychosis, it can cause suicidal ideations. Subsequently, the black box warning has been removed and uh, varenicline has been used uh, in patients with severe mental illness as well, but obviously with these cautions. 
uh, and therefore, I mean, you know, uh, I, I know this, the, for example, the Simita trials in the UK have also offered Varenicillin for people with SMI. But I think as with all drugs, I mean, whether it's bupropion and seizures, bupropion and you know, hyperglycemia, varenicline and agitation, I think counseling and even with NRT, I think there are a lot of patients who do develop side effects very often because they don't know how to use it. For example, they swallow the saliva and get a lot of gastritis. So one of the things to tell patients is really how to do the you know, chew and park method. Similarly to warn patients that if they do develop any kind of agitation or uh, you know, problems with varenicline to report it immediately. And that's very important. I think with any of the drugs that we use in addiction, I think it's very important to tell patients about the side effects and the need to get back in touch with us. So I think that's only one patient who woke you up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, madam, uh, uh, some patients complain they get addicted with nicotine gums itself. What to do? So, I mean, I, I, remember, I remember a senior... Uh, uh, you know, Inspector General of Police, uh, you or take the example of Barack Obama. I think he continues to use NRT. Now, the point is that uh, NRT, it's a, it's a harm reduction approach. So even using NRT longer term is possibly relative to smoking is possibly safer. When we talk, the, I think one of the things that was not done, even when NRT was introduced, I think it's been around for a decade or more, more than a decade, is that we did not address the vulnerabilities to addiction. I think over time, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, or other prescription drugs, we know that any kind of temperamental vulnerabilities and mood and anxiety are prominent factors. So I think unless we teach people to deal with it in a different, uh, you know, in a different way, it's not going to be possible for them. And that's why some of them do continue NRT. NRTs are expensive. So people who want to simply use, you know, it in some form will probably go switch back to, you know, cigarettes or, or thing, unless they're very particular about their health. But relatively, nicotine replacement therapy is safer than going back to. Um, how about uh, nicotine gums before exams? For what? <laughs> for exam performance. I mean, if for people who have not used tobacco or nicotine before, it can actually produce a lot of unpleasant symptoms, you know, lightheadedness, you know, b burning in the mouth, etc. So whether it's nicotine before exams or tremors of the hand, you know, so whether it's nicotine before exams or stimulants to sit up all night, they're extremely risky business. I, I wouldn't do that. I would rather study and appear for the exam and advise people to do so as well. But stress I think understanding, dealing with stress, with cog cognitions, anxious cognitions, these are very important. And that's why it becomes very important that we address, we help people, we teach them safe ways of dealing with anxiety and with mood ch changes. Okay, there's another question from Rajesh Jain. He's asking, medicinal cannabis in smoking cessation? Have you heard of? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that the topic of, of the day, there are so many medical uses of cannabis that have been spoken about. And the cannabis is the new nicotine. I think one must understand that. I think there are a lot, we still don't know a lot about cannabis. So I think while certainly cannabis has medicinal properties in terms of analgesia, in terms of, you know, some other conditions where it is particularly for analgesia, I think we still haven't, yeah, anti-nausea drugs, cancer, you know, part of the cancer chemotherapy uh, uh, protocols and so on, reduction of glaucoma. We know that there are a lot of uh, medicinal effects of cannabis, but in terms of the prescription of cannabis, in terms of the how, you know, the, uh, the legalization of cannabis, there are a lot more than meets the eye. So I think one must really look at the evidence carefully before, you know, going that way. Can I also say that, Smoking cannabis is as harmful or more harmful than tobacco. It seems to cause greater ciliary damage, greater inflammation within the lungs. So clearly not something I would, you know, look lightly on. The 70s, 80s Bollywood movies had, uh, you know, smoking was considered as a, you know, style. And, uh, you know, mostly people were rich, you know, uh, the protagonist or the hero would, uh, they have to smoke. So this has not changed uh, now even like if you watch KGF or any other recent Kannada movies also, you see 
so it's seen as you know uh, heroic or some kind of action this will impact on the young younger mind so has anything been done to i mean uh, you i mean actually it is prevented isn't it advertising of tobacco in any form is actually against the law and you have to put your statutory warnings that's what they do uh, the, the, you know in small warning in so i think i think as a society you know we we have normalized tobacco use for many many centuries you know and i think unless we denormalize tobacco use i mean i was just telling i was at, talking on the world no tobacco day i was telling people about these phantom cigarettes that as kids you know i don't sweet all cigarettes. of us must have used those sweet cigarettes you know and put it in our, our mouths and you know i i've done it so i think there was a there's a lot of glorification around tobacco use or you know people like uh, film stars who blew you know uh, cigarette circles and you know and the way they flip the cigarettes it was supposed to be thing <laughs> the same people have actually gone on record on their 60th birthday and said please do give up tobacco use you know it is not thing but i think it is much more powerful when younger people people who are you know who are in key influence in society now actually talk about denormalizing tobacco rahul dravid for example is a spokesperson now and i think our badminton player what's her name now the um, uh, sindhu 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 is now a spokesperson so i think having young people successful people you know talk about not using tobacco and being role models in society is very very important to denormalize tobacco use in society right i think we are going over time uh, madam may I, uh, last final comments from you and then followed by uh, sir so yeah i think i think for too long we have somewhere failed as health professionals in terms of you know routinely asking for tobacco use in our patients it should be part of our essential evaluation of patients like we ask for hypertension like we record bp and pulse we should record tobacco use status we should tell people about the harms of tobacco encourage them to quit but more importantly be empathetic and offer them quit services and as i mentioned follow up particularly in cases of dependent patients is very very important we also have to go beyond our clinics to tell people in society to denormalize tobacco use and to reduce the treatment gap which is extremely high i just also thought that in addition to the, to the naltrexone question uh in acute interventions there have there been a couple of papers which show that but in terms of longer term you know reductions there has been no evidence so i'd like all of us to be ambassadors to promote tobacco cessation and to prevent people from using tobacco any comments from you sir yeah so i think prathima used an important phrase earlier she said it's the only legalized form of addiction that harms every single organ in the body that's something that i think we should keep in mind uh, as pratima said you know we don't often ask for uh, the history of tobacco use and somebody who's got flagrant tobacco associated disease so i remember an article several years ago in the bmj which suggested that it should be made a vital sign and just like your record pulse rate and bp tobacco use history should be taken Uh, one of our foremost pulmonologists had the honesty to publish a paper in one of our national conferences where you know out of 100 percent 100 persons who were admitted to their icu on a ventilator for acute exacerbations of copd a uh, smoking history was taken only in 3 percent of them which is a tragedy and none of them were offered tobacco cessation advice that's the stage i mean i think psychiatrists do very much better Uh, other professionals do really badly when it comes to asking for a tobacco history and advising cessation remembering that the single piece of advice from the treating physician the gp has had the greatest success a very brief advice less than a minute has had the greatest success in getting people to quit and finally vijay i just wanted to add that physicians can get addicted to tobacco themselves and one of the things that has been happening is that physicians are coming forward more and more to get help to quit physicians have to be role models to other to to the other people so you know staying away from tobacco and getting help if they themselves are addicted is also very important okay i think we had uh, I, i i think you all agree with me we had an excellent session uh, it was very informative and for uh, madam's uh, students i think uh, and uh, colleagues i think it was a booster uh, for most of them 
and uh, i think with this we we wind up uh, today's session thank you very much sir uh, thank you very much madam and thank you mr ganeshan for uh, supporting uh, uh, on behalf of microlabs and thanks mayesh and uh, dr jagdish as well thank you everyone and every you know all of these participants because i think because of you we are able to uh, you know conduct these programs otherwise uh, without you we cannot do it so thank you very much for attending it was i think 60 65 people that attended today thank you very much i hope uh, uh, it was informative to you all thank you very much have a have a good day shubhratri good night thank you madam thank you sir thank you for being a part i think you made every teetotaler proud today like me <laughs> so very happy thank you madam it was very very informative and interesting thank you thank you, thank you. good night good night